on fetal heart tracing. This is an introduction into basic fetal monitoring. My name is Lynn Whitmer. I'm one of the instructors in the Ocala campus, and I welcome you to one of your initial online recorded lecture sessions. There should be a session each week. All right, let us begin. Fetal monitoring to try to stop or impede uh, birth injuries. We wanted to be able to see real time what was happening in utero to the reaction of the baby during the contractions. Please understand that a contraction is a muscular reaction causing a, a compression onto the fetal vessels. So as the baby's being squeezed, I call them baby hugs, as there is a contraction happening, there is a decrease of fetal oxygen, there's a decrease of fetal nutrients, so the baby goes through what I call mini hypoxic episodes. So as I'm having a contraction, the baby's going, getting a little hypoxic, and that's okay because they have a higher level of oxygen in their bodies. So we thought by doing real-time continuous fetal monitoring, we could stop the result of some brain injuries or severe hypoxia. What we have found is that it really only increased the number of C-sections that are being done. So when should fetal heart rate monitoring be used? Any time that we feel we need to assess a baby. So any of those risk factors that you've already identified through your reading, hypertension, diabetes that has a vascular uh, component, a mom who is a smoker, a mom who uses drugs, a mom who doesn't have very good nutrition, a mom with some type of autoimmune disease such as um, sorry, lupus or any other connective tissue disease. These are the women we want to be doing frequent fetal heart monitoring to ensure that the environment for the fetus inside the uterus is safe and healthy. Why? We, got, we want to prevent and quickly intervene if we note that there is a problem. Um, and we've already discussed what maternal illnesses could affect fetal well-being. And where do we do fetal monitoring? Any clinical hospital with obstetrics, but you will not see a fetal monitor in an emergency room because there is a legal component to this. A nurse must be able to read and interpret a fetal monitoring strips. And if you are not able to do that, or if you've not completed the basic and advanced ba um, fetal monitoring courses, then you would not be held legally responsible. Therefore, emergency room nurses who are not going to see this very frequently are going to be held responsible. So you have a patient that rolls into your emergency department that is pregnant. She's going straight upstairs or into the labor and delivery area for assessments. It's usually the fastest ride in the hospital. Those, those wheelchairs move quickly. So what was the result of adding fetal monitoring into our cache of tools for the labor suites? It didn't improve outcome, but it has caused an increase in cesarean sections. In fact, the rate is close to 50%, which is being looked at very closely by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to cough for a moment. All right, now what you see in front of you is a fetal monitor. This is one unit. There are multiple forms out there. There's um, older models, there's newer models, and there's, they're always looking to improve the equipment, to improve the readout, to improve the, the data that we can collect with these monitors to the point that we may eventually never have the paper trail. It goes into an archived um, server but it is part of the legal document. So please do not offer any part of the paper to any of your patients for their, their little baby books because this is part of the legal document and we cannot do that. So again, looking at this fetal monitor as you're looking at it, as you're viewing it, the picture that you see to the left or, or the little numbers you see to the left are the fetal heart rate. The number in the box in the middle is the um, strength of the contraction, but please understand that with external fetal monitoring, we cannot get accurate strength. All you can get is frequency of contractions. On top of that monitor, you see the little, 
the box with the three discs, that, those are, that's a bottle warmer, which is very nice. You can put the gel in those little areas and it can warm it up. When you're looking at the paper there that you'll see on the right side of the picture, the paper is in a vertical position right now. The notations on the left side of the paper is fetal heart rate again, and the notation on the right side of the paper is contractions. So you can see there's a lot of movement, a lot of changes from minute to minute in, in, on that paper, and you would have to learn to be able to read and interpret this. It is not an EKG reading. Some of the equipment that you'll need to have when you're using your fetal monitor is, first of all, these are the tocos or the pressure. It's for measuring contractions. As you can see, this part is the outside. This is the inside. So this is what lays next to mommy's skin. This is a little pressure sensitive device here. As the uterus contracts, the muscle gets harder underneath this device, it will read it as pressure. That pressure will be interpreted onto a piece of paper. The next device we see is for listening, the ultrasound, to listen to the heart tone. Again, this is the outside of the monitor. This is the inside. It's kind of a little bit of a concave dome. We put jelly on there, conductive jelly, electronic conductive jelly, so that we can pick up through sone waves or sono waves what the fetal heart rate is. You're going to need to do your Leopold's maneuvers initially to identify the position of the baby, the best place to lay this ultrasound device is at the baby's back of his neck or close to his back of his, the, the back where would the chest would be. So you're going to want to find what I call PMI, which is not a proper term in fetal monitoring, but your pulse of maximum impulse. And um, so you need to do Leopold's to identify that. What should the fetal heart rate be? And while you're thinking about that answer, we'll go on to the next part of this. If you answer that the fetal heart rate should be between 100 and a 10 and 160 beats per minute, you are correct. <clears throat> These are the pink and blue straps that we use. You can kind of make a little bit of a game of it. They are like a velcro -y, stretchy belt that goes around a woman's abdomen. One goes under one goes under these belts, one goes under these belts, and you need to then place them snugly around her abdomen so you can pick up the sounds and movements. If you don't have it snug enough, we're not going to get accurate spacing of the contractions, and if you don't have it snug enough, you may not pick up an accurate fetal heart rate. What you will be picking up are placental sounds, and that's not what you want to do. And finally, this is a Doppler, which most, some of you have, might have seen in your medical surgical arenas. A Doppler is a very fine point instrument, handheld instrument that is used to pick up fetal heart tones if for some reason we do not need to do fetal monitoring. Someone comes in in preterm labor and we just want to listen to make sure that the baby is viable, we might just use this. Um, but in preterm labor, I'm concerned with the uterine activity as well, so I'm going to put her on a fetal monitor. With the Doppler, you can hear audible sounds. What is the earliest that we hear audible fetal heart tones? And I'll give you a minute to answer that question. <coughs> if you stated between 10 and 12 weeks gestation, you are correct. And again, this is a patient laying in bed with her fetal monitor on this top this top belt is what we're doing to assess maternal activity or uterine activity. This lower belt is where we're hearing fetal heart tones. So you can see most babies turn into a vertex or head down position as early as around 32 to 34 weeks gestation. And so we should be able to pick up most fetal heart tones in the lower quadrant of the abdomen. To pick up maternal activity or uterine contractions, it is best to, to place the toco where the fundus, or top of the uterus, is. Remember, fundus equates to top of uterus. Fetal monitoring, this is what you're going to see. This is the paper that is used. And as you see, when we lay it out in a horizontal manner, 
you're going to see several minutes in front of you. You want to note what fetal heart rate is over time, not right now. You want to see what has been happening over time. What's the environment of the uterus been, been like? So the very first thing you're going to do is note your baseline. Please note that the paper, as you can see, changes from 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210, 240 for fetal heart rate. These dark lines that you see here represent a minute of time. So this heart rate has accelerated over almost two minutes of time, which is pretty, pretty significant. Here on the bottom of the page, so the top of the page is your fetal heart rate, the bottom of the page is your maternal activity. And so we can see that the uterus is doing something, nothing real significant, but it is doing some action. Remember, please remember, and I'll state it again, remember, strength of fetal heart rate is not noted in external fetal monitoring. All we can note is the frequency of the, of the contractions. So let's read. Oops, I apologize for this slide. Um, fetal heart tracing, start with your baseline, then look for variability, accelerations, decelerations, and we're going to define each of those as we go through. So baseline is your fetal heart beat over time. You need to give a number as to what you think the fetal heart rate. If I were to draw a straight line across the fetal monitor paper, what was the number I would see most frequently? Most babies we know are from 110 to 160. That is the normal parameter. So if you find any number within that parameter, we're good. <coughs> Variability, let me add that that is the most important piece of the fetal monitor strip, the variability. This is the response of the baby's heartbeat second to second, minute to minute, um, based on his environmental changes. So as his oxygen levels increase or decrease, we're going to see some changes of his fetal heart rate. This line should never be straight. I can equate it with your EKG levels of asystole. You never want to see that, right? So you want to see a constant change, a constant shift, a constant movement of that variability. And variability comes in four degrees, which we'll get back to when we speak to variability. Accelerations is when the fetal heart rate rises above the baseline. This is always a positive response because we know the baby has a great oxygen supply and can manage whatever environmental issues are coming his way. So accelerations are always positive. In fact, we can measure accelerations. Decelerations could be good or bad. I shouldn't be say good, but not bad necessarily. So decelerations are either very bad or just bears watching. And there are different kinds of decelerations, again, which we will mention when we get to decelerations to talk in depth. It's when it falls below the baseline. We're going to talk about them right here. OK, early. Early mirrors the contraction. We'll have some more explanation for that. So an early deceleration is one that represents head compression. As the baby's head is being squeezed, as we're getting closer to the delivery of the baby, it causes a vagal response. And that vagal response mirrors the contractions. So as the uterus is contracting, causing that little bit of hypoxia, the head is being squeezed, causing a vagal response. So when the contraction goes away, the deceleration goes away. So what you should see is the deceleration begin as the contraction begins, and the deceleration goes away as the contraction ends. Therefore, the deceleration will mirror the contraction. It is called a head compression. Compression, I'm sorry. So early decelerations are head compression. Late decelerations are always bad should always be looked at suspiciously if they bear watching, and we need to identify why we're having them. What is happening again is as the uterus contracts, the fetal heart rate is not affected until the uterus stops contracting. We know by thoughts of perfusion or the concept of perfusion, if there's nothing impeding the perfusion, there should be no impediment to the heart. However, in a late deceleration, after the contraction is over, we see the heart rate drop. So this suggests to us that the placenta 
is broken. The placenta is sick. And we note from our earlier reading, it's all about the placenta. If the placenta is not functioning, the baby's environment will be poor. So we have to ensure that our placenta, we need to monitor this to ensure that the placenta is going to be able to support this baby during the most crucial time, which is during the contraction or the laboring process. So again, a late deceleration, we're going to see a deceleration follow after the contraction. The third deceleration is called variable, meaning it can happen at any time. It can be spontaneous or it can be in response to a contraction. It is a sharp descent of the fetal heart rate and a sharp ascent of the fetal heart rate once the contraction is over or once the event is over. I truly believe in my own personal theory is babies can sometimes get a hold of the cord. We know babies have a primitive response that if something goes into their hand, they squeeze it. So I'm thinking if the cord happens to float into their hand, they're going to squeeze the cord. As they squeeze it, of course, they are cutting off their air supply. And once it cuts off enough, they'll get comfortable, they'll relax, and they let go. Now, I can't show that in literature. I can't prove it. It's just one of my theories. So when you see the sharp decline of fetal heart rate, you know that it is a cord compression. Cord compression. So let me review very briefly. Decelerations come in three flavors, early, late, and variable. Early being head compression, late being placental insufficiency, and variable being cord compression. And we're going to show you pictures of all of those different things. So again, let's start with baseline here. And let me put my little green marker away because we do not need it any longer. Thank you. Baseline, what would the baseline of this fetal heart rate tracing be? If you stated about 140 to 145, I would agree with you. Because when you draw a line across there, you're going to see approximately about 140 to 145. So if we looked at that picture across there, we would see that most of the time, the fetal heart rate is in the 140s position. So baseline. You always must start with baseline. If you do not know baseline, you will not be able to tell when there's a change in fetal heart rate. So please identify baseline. This is for variability, and I apologize because Let me go back. I apologize here. We've got to figure out. This is for variability, and I said variability was the most important piece. And as you can see here, my little red lines, which are not coming in very well for you. I may have to point it out with my little pointer. Um, so from this part to this part, if we said variability, we want to see, we want to note these changes from beat to beat, second to second, minute to minute. You see it changes. It's undulating. It, it doesn't stay in a straight line, which is a very healthy response to environmental changes. This proves that the baby has a sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system that is functional. If he did not, we would not see those changes. And there are four kinds, as you see up here, there are four types of variability, marked, moderate, minimal, and absent. In your textbook, it's going to give you very specific outliers for each of those uh, terminology. I do not expect you to have it that great of detail. What I want you to recognize that marked is healthy, moderate is good, minimal, the baby's in some type of distress possibly, and absence mean we're really in trouble. So a marked variability would look something like this, but even though that's an acceleration, a marked variability would look something like this, because the change from this point to this point is pretty dramatic. So we know he has great, uh, he has great oxygen reserves. Minimal variability, uh, this is more moderate right here, to be honest, moderate to minimal. So moderate, we might take it in here from. So from this point to this point is pretty significant. So he has a great oxygen response. And then minimal, less change from here to here, means that there's less oxygen reserve. Now, sometimes babies are in a minimal 
variability because they're asleep. Remember, babies sleep 20 out of 24 hours, and they do the same in utero. So he has a sleep pattern that he's going to establish throughout his day. And if we're continually monitoring someone over time, you're going to see a lot of sleep patterns. The other reason for minimal variability might be drugs that the mother used. Hypertension. There's no perfusion to the mom because of the hypertension. And if there's no perfusion, the baby's not going to have a lot of changes minute to minute, second to second. Um, I already mentioned drugs, poor nutrition, um, not a lot of fluid around the mom or around the baby. So there's lots of reasons for minimal variability. Think perfusion. The concept of perfusion is what you need to be thinking about when you think fetal monitoring. If the baby is not getting the perfusion through the placenta, we need to identify what's causing the placenta to be ill. All right. Medications we give to mother systemically. If we give her some opioids or something to help her relax or take some of the pain away during labor can also cause minimal variability because the drug also goes to the baby. Remember, everything mom ingests, everything mother breathes, everything mother swallows goes to the baby. There's only a couple things that do not cross into the placenta because the molecules are too big and one of those are insulin and the other are, is heparin. So that is variability, the most important piece. So, so far we've covered baseline, we've covered variability. Let's talk about accelerations. Acceleration is the change from baseline up. So that's an acceleration. Accelerations are always a positive response. And during a non-stress test, which you should have read about in your textbook, a non-stress test, we can measure how well the baby's coping with his environment. Every time he moves, we should see an acceleration or an increase in heart rate that is greater than 15 beats per, s per minute over 15 beats, uh, greater than 15 beats per minute over 15 seconds. I apologize, it's 15 by 15 rule. And as you can see, if we were doing a non-stress test on this baby, he would pass it he would have what we call a reactive strip because he does have a greater than 15 beat acceleration and it is over a greater than 15 second time frame. So this baby would be a reactive, healthy, happy, environment is safe baby. And then this is his sleep cycle where he's now tired and he's going to sleep because he's had two movements here and here. So accelerations are positive and as I'm pointing those out to you. Decelerations, not always a good thing, um, not a good thing, but not always a terribly bad thing. What you're seeing in front of you right now are what we call those early decelerations, and I explain those to be head compression. As the baby's moving down through the vagina, he's getting a vagal response, his head is being compressed, and his heart rate is going to drop in response to that. So you note that the, con that the deceleration mirrors the contraction. So as she is contracting, as the contraction begins, the deceleration begins. As the contraction ends, the deceleration ends. So it is actually mirroring the contraction. So we call those heads or head compression, meaning the head is being squeezed. There is a vagal response. And you'll see my little drawings here to support that. I got very excited when I was able to make these a little animated. Now, the other thing I want to point out, first of all, is what is your fetal heart rate here? I'd say it's about 100, or like 110 maybe, is our baseline. Um, and we have decreased variability here, right? We have minimal to maybe, yeah, that's minimal variability. It's pretty limited, meaning the baby's probably got some medications on board because mom either has an epidural or she had some medications to get her to the point of completely dilated to start pushing her baby down. So we're not seeing great variability here, so there's not a lot of oxygen reserve, or else the baby has, been got, has gotten fatigued because of the long labor that mother has been in. So we don't really know the clinical picture here, we just know that this isn't optimal. This is less than optimal, so it bears watching. But these are okay because it comes back to baseline after the contraction is over, okay? 
late decelerations, as I was pointing out, when the contraction is happening, and when the contraction is ended, that is where we see the worst part of the deceleration. So these are related to placental insufficiency. The placenta cannot support the baby's need for oxygen. Let's also look again at variability. You see it is minimal to moderate. I'm going to say more minimal variability again. Baby's fatigued. Baby's been in labor a long time. Placenta just hasn't been giving the baby enough oxygen at any time. Therefore, now when there is a contraction and when the baby's put at the most stress, his ability to manage the, the contractions is not good. And so these are late decelerations. You see that the deceleration happens after the contraction. And these are placental insufficiencies. And I point those out to you again. Now this one here is a much more subtle. So we really have to be paying attention if we're going to pick that up. This is just as dangerous as this. It's just that it's a little more subtle and we need to be paying attention to it. But again, the worst part of the, of the deceleration is happening at the base or when the contraction is just about or completely over. What you see in this bottom tracing is very ominous. This baby has two things that are bad. Number one, he has the late decelerations. As you can see, baseline is here in the 140s. He decelerates into the less than, it looks like the 90s, 100, about 100. But it is happening long after the contraction is over. Where the best perfusion should be, there is nothing. In addition to that, in addition to that, we have the absent variability. There is no beat-to-beat -beat change here. And with no beat-to-beat -beat change, this baby is in very serious trouble. This baby will die if we do not intervene and get him out quickly. And in addition to that, I do not know how much cerebral effect there has been with this type of tracing. So we need to respond to this tracing quickly. And again, your late decelerations. Variable decelerations, as I was talking about, are can be spontaneous or with contractions. Again, our baseline is around 150, 160. And then the baby's heart rate just drops drastically, very sharply. This happens to coincide with a contraction, but it doesn't necessarily have to do that because this is cord compression. The cord is being compressed and the oxygen supply to the baby is being cut off. But as soon as the cord is released, you see the oxygen comes back up and the baby goes on about his merry way. And in fact, he has relatively good variability here. Moderate to even marked variability. But again, when another contraction hits, for some reason that cord is in the way and it is a drastic, dramatic drop in fetal heart rate, but return to baseline once the contraction is over. So variable decelerations are equated to cord compression. And I'm sure, OK. Now if we talk about maternal, we're talking about the contractions. Let me put my little pointer away. Contractions are the uterine activity. This is the uterus tightening or getting strong. This is a muscle. The uterus is one of the largest muscles in the body at this point in time. It takes up a lot of volume. It takes up a lot of space. And so it takes a lot of attention. As the uterus contracts, what's actually happening is that the muscle fibers of the uterus are shortening. They're getting a little smaller. And as they are getting smaller, it's pulling the uterus up around the baby. Please try to picture that. Picture it as an upside down turtleneck sweater. Sometimes that helps. As you pull a turtleneck sweater over your head, the opening of the turtleneck sweater gets wider, which allows us to get it through our, over our head, right? So that's what's happening. As the uterus is contracting, it's getting shorter. As it's getting shorter, it's pulling that uterus around the baby, because we're trying to expel the baby out of the uterus. That's what our body's doing. It's pushing the baby out of the uterus. To do that, the cervix has to open as the opening to your turtleneck sweater. It has to open. However, in this case, because it is a, almost an impediment, it has to thin first. The cervix thins, and then it starts to open. We may not necessarily see that in a turtleneck sweater. The 
the uh, depth of the turtleneck doesn't get any less, but it does stretch open. So if that helps you a little bit, okay. If it made you more confused, I apologize. So uterine activity, we're watching the contractions. So remember I said early in this presentation that with external fetal monitoring, the only thing that you're going to assess is frequency of contractions. We cannot determine the strength. We read our contractions from the beginning of one to the beginning of the next contraction. That's how we measure the, the frequency or the distance. Our goal for accurate or for efficient labor is we want our contractions to be two to four minutes apart. How long does the contraction last? Usually they, la they start out at you know, 30, 20 to 30 seconds, and they can go all the way up to 45 seconds in duration, which seems like a very long, 45 seconds to, to um, a minute, a minute, a few. So that seems like a very long time when you're in the midst of that contraction. So let's look at our contractions here. As you can see, we start here, and we measure it to here. So when we look at these dark lines, the very dark line, which is, let me get my little pointer. Oh, it's not going to follow me now for some reason. I'm having trouble getting my pointer to respond to me. go. So these dark lines from here to here are a minute. So if we start, it's right before the minute mark, so we'll go one minute, two minute, three minutes, four, just a little over four minutes in, in uh, frequency. All right? So you see from here to here is about four minutes, so she's contracting about every four minutes which might work very well for her, but in most cases the contractions need to be two to four minutes apart, two to three minutes apart. So again, if we go from the beginning of this contraction here to there's one minute, two minutes, three. So that one's about three minutes apart. And if we'll do the next one, we start here again, one, two, about two and a half minutes now for those contractions. So you see that um, this contraction pattern is getting a little closer together, and those are appropriate. The reason we need to have time between contractions are twofold. One, for the uterine muscle. The uterine muscle, if we kept it contracted the entire time, would get fatigued, and it would not be able to function. It would not be able to expel that baby. And the second piece is the baby would have no oxygen. So we need to ensure that the baby, there's a rest period between contractions so that the baby gets that perfusion. Remember those baby hugs, if the hugs are too strong, too close together, and lasting too long, that's more time that the baby is without oxygen, without nutrition, without perfusion. So we want to ensure um, that that's working. All right. So external fetal monitoring, we put the belts over. We, remember, we put one belt, one toco, across where we feel the contractions would be the strongest, and then also where we feel the PMI or the fetal heart rate would be, and that's usually at the back of the baby's neck. So you have to do Leopold's to determine position. The good thing about external fetal monitoring, it's non-invasive. We don't hurt anything. We do not hurt a baby. He just kind of goes with it. The con is that the baby and the patient cannot move. Because once the mom moves and once the baby moves, it is no longer accurate and we have to go back and readjust everything, which can be a real challenge for the nurse if the baby's really active and a challenge for the patient because she's kind of locked into the bed now. So in that respect, I particularly am an, not opposed to continuous fetal monitoring, but find it an, an hindrance at times for, for patients. Internal monitoring now is another story. If we want to actually get very accurate readings of the contractions and very accurate readings of the fetal heart rate, I will put monitors inside the uterine cavity. To do that, however, I have to rupture membranes. And remember that once I have ruptured membranes, please let me repeat, once I rupture membranes, I have now set her up for infection. The biggest risk to SROM, spontaneous rupture of membranes, SROM, 
or ARAM, artificial rupture of membranes, is infection because ascending bacteria can now reach the baby a lot easier than he could once that membrane was intact. So once we rupture membranes, the clock starts ticking as to the time we have to get this baby out. It's done under sterile technique, so the physician will use sterile gloves. We can put in a fetal scalp electrode. Some people call it a fetal scalp clip. There's different things, it's different terminology used in each labor and delivery area depending on the region of the country you're in. But this is actually like a little screw device that slides right under the baby's skin. So does it cause pain? Perhaps your babies will respond to this activity. But we do get a direct fetal heart rate. There is no question if the baby moves, I'm still going to be able to keep him connected to my fetal monitor. The other piece of equipment is called an interuterine pressure catheter, IUPC. It is very accurate. Now we can measure the pressure that uterus is placing against that baby, against that placenta. So I know exactly what is the strength of the contractions. These devices are used um, less and less because we know it is invasive. But if necessary, if I am concerned of the well-being of a baby and I am not able to monitor from the indirect route on the outside or external fetal monitoring, then I will use the internal monitoring method. The pros are it's very accurate, and the cons are that there, it is invasive and there's a risk for infection. And the most contraindicated reasons would be if a patient has HIV or an open lesion of HSV, which is herpes, I certainly would not want to rupture membranes in either of those cases. So we go back to the need to have some maternal history. This is a little picture of internal fetal monitoring. It is not 100% accurate because you see that fetal scalp electrode I am having more problems with my little green. This more, looks more like a little plunger, but that really indeed is a little screw that kind of, or spring that goes under the baby's skin. It's very sharp and just slides right under the baby's skin so we get a contact to the baby. Now if the baby has a lot of hair, sometimes we don't get a real good contact. Reasons for fetal monitoring, again, we want to assess fetal well-being. If it's unreassuring, we'll do the internal monitoring like we talked about. And if a patient is extremely obese and is uncomfortable or we cannot put the external monitors on her comfortably or without the baby and we're not getting a good tracking, we might want to do, do it for that reason as well. Let's read some strips together now. Hopefully you guys are staying with me here. Again, we always start with baseline. So what is your baseline in this particular I'll monitor strip, and I'll give you just a couple minutes here. These are a little difficult to read um, because they're so tiny. But if you said about 130, 140, I would give you credit for that. So the baseline is about 130, 140. The second piece of information we want to know is variability. What is your variability? And if you said it was moderate to marked, I would agree with you. Marked being the best, moderate being okay, minimal being we bears watching, and absent, of course, is bad. So this is marked because I would see all of this activity going on. This is that beat to beat, beat to beat, and then it goes into a much more minimal here. And why did we say babies will spontaneously go into minimal variability? They're asleep, that's correct. They are sleeping, possibly. Do we see accelerations? That's our third piece of information. Do we see accelerations? And yes, we do. Right here's a great example of an acceleration. And at the end of this strip, we see a great example of an acceleration. So that's excellent. Do we see decelerations? No, we do not. And people will point this out to me here. And they point this out, or maybe this. I call those little ditzels. They don't have any effect on the baby because he's right back to baseline. So I don't think that's a medical term. It's a word I've made up, but I call it a ditzel. 
So do not worry about that little bit. But it bears the fact that you are paying attention and you're seeing it. That's excellent. Then the fifth piece of information we look at, of course, is maternal activity. And we, do we see any contractions here? No, we do not. So this is probably a non-stress test that we are doing for someone because she's a smoker, she's used drugs in the past, she has hypertension, she's diabetic on insulin, some other risk factor to this woman that we're wanting to monitor the baby interuterine. All right, let's read another strip together. Again, we go with baseline. What is your baseline? We always start with baseline. So let me give you just a minute. If we drew a straight line across, what would you see? And if you said around 170, you are correct. Now let me point out something that I didn't discuss thus far. We said that the normal parameter of fetal heart rate is between 110 and 160 beats per minute. So if I see a baseline or time, over time a fetal heart rate that is greater than 160, that is called fetal tachycardia. When I see fetal heart rate over time below 110, that's fetal bradycardia. So what do you think would cause fetal tachycardia? Mom just drank a cup of coffee. Mom had a Coke. Mom had a cigarette. Mom got really excited. Mom's used some drugs like we talked about. Or mom might have a fever. So if we've been monitoring a patient for very long periods of time and all of a sudden the baby's now becoming tachycardic, I would check mom's temperature and you might find that she now has a fever. How do I respond to this? How do we respond to anybody with a fever? Well, we give them more fluids to try and clear perfusion. If that doesn't work, we're going to change her position. If that doesn't work, then we're going to treat the fever. Uh, give her some Tylenol, and then perhaps um, maybe we'll need to start some antibiotics. But we need to kind of note what we think this might be. So we have to have a historical picture. We've got to look back at the past fetal monitor strip and look and be watching what's coming up behind us. So we noted that the baseline is 170. What is the second piece? It is variability. What is your variability? And that is your beat to beat change. And with this variability, I think it looks pretty marked. It's up and down and all around. So I would say we have marked, well, initially marked variability. And then it kind of goes in this area. It's a little more moderate to minimal variability. OK? Third piece of information is accelerations. Do we see accelerations? Well, my goodness, the fetal heart rate's already elevated. Would I want to find accelerations? Yes, because it shows that the baby has the oxygen reserve. This is, a, this is an XL. This is an XL. This is the start of an XL. A little bit here. So yes, this baby has some accelerations, which is a very good point. Does this baby have decelerations? Well, by golly, yes, he does, right here. And he has another one right here. And he has one right here. Now we understand that to identify what type of decelerations, we have to look at contractions. And we see that that, that decel kind of goes right with the contraction. But we also know it's very sharp and returns to baseline very rapidly. And do you remember what kind of deceleration that was? If we look over here, we see the same thing, a sharp deceleration down and back. We know that that is a cord compression. So it just so happens that it's happening while she's pushing this baby out. This is a pushing contraction. So I know that the cord is probably around the head somewhere that is causing some pressure on the cord. So this is a cord compression that goes away when the contraction disappears. So she's having. Uh, variable decelerations, which represent cord compression. Is she contracting? Nothing here, then a big contraction. Nothing here, then a contraction. Nothing here, and a contraction. Now, you would say that these are, these are irregular. That is, you are correct. But she is pushing. So we're not too concerned with the timing of the contractions, as long as the baby's doing all right. So we see that she's contracting here, here, and here. So 
in between here is about a minute and a half to two minutes, but here to here is about four minutes. Okay? So very good. Let's read another strip. How are we doing out there? You guys doing okay? You getting it? If you're not getting it, please email me today and let me know, and I will try to respond to your emails as quickly as I can. Again, what is our baseline? Baseline is about 150, right? If we draw a straight line across here, we get about 150. What's the second piece? If you said variability, you are correct. And what kind of variability do we have? Here it's about minimal, minimal, moderate in here. Nothing real exciting. So baby's probably been laboring for a while. He's getting tired. Third piece would be your accelerations. Do we see excels? A little bit here, maybe not so much there. So yes, he's got a little bit going on. Does he have D cells? Yes, he does. Here and here. And when we look at the contractions, it kind of mirrors the contraction, but it's also sharp. So now we have a little bit of a combination of two kinds of ex, uh, decelerations. And do you remember what the ones were that mirror the contraction? If you said early, you are correct. Early decelerations, which represent head compression, is what is happening here, but it's also a little on the sharp side, which we said was cord compression. So we have a little bit of early cord compression because, again, mom is pushing with this monitor or with this contraction pattern. We can see mom is pushing. So it's at the end of her labor and she's bearing down. Very good. Again, what kinds of decelerations are we seeing here? Here and here and here. But before we even look at that, we have to look at baseline, don't we? What's our baseline? If we drew a picture of a line straight across, we'd say it's 150. Do we have variability? Yeah, we do. Not great variability, but we're seeing some change, beat to beat, beat to beat. So I would say moderate variability. Decelerations, or I'm sorry, do we see any accelerations? That's our third piece. No, I'm not seeing any acceleration above baseline, but I am seeing the decels. And if I look at the contraction, they are mirroring the contractions, aren't they? Every time she has a contraction, the fetal heart rate does the very same thing, only upside down. And that is called early decelerations, hence the words early decelerations and it requires or it represents head compression. We get very excited as nurses seeing those uh, because we know the baby's moving down. Baseline, 150 again. Accelerations, no. But I forgot to ask you variability. Variability is minimal to moderate in between you see it just changing very slightly, beat to beat. Decelerations, yes, and they mirror the contractions again. But they're a little sharper this time. They're not nice and round. So we call those variable decelerations because they represent what? If you said cord compression, you are correct. Please note that the contractions, again, somewhat irregular, but a little closer together now. If we go one minute, oh, this is a minute here. I apologize. Let's see. One minute, ah, oh, one and a half minutes. One minute and a half. So from the start of here, one minute and a half, almost two minutes. So one to two minutes apart are these contractions. They're a little bit close together, but again, she's pushing now. Baby looks like he's coping fine with it, so I'm not too concerned. And again, your early variable decelerations because they are mirroring the contraction, but they're sharp. What is happening in these pictures that we've been seeing is that the cord is probably wrapped around the baby's neck. Very common phenomenon. Please don't go, oh my gosh. Is a very common phenomenon, happens in about 40% of all births, that the cord is wrapped at least once around, maybe twice. 
The phenomena or the scary ones are when they're three, four, and five times around the baby's neck. All right, these are variable decelerations again, but note that they're getting a little bit deeper now. So again, baseline, baseline's about 140. If we drew a straight line across, where we see the heart rate the most of the time is about 140. We note that variability is about minimal in between here. And we know that there's no accelerations, but there is decelerations. These deep, deep, deep decelerations. So what's the contractions doing? Doesn't look like they're very strong, does it? But remember we said with external fetal monitoring, we can only tell the distance, the frequency, not the strength. Here mom did a nice push to see if she could get that baby to move down. And when she pushed, the fetal heart rate dropped even a little bit deeper. So this is a cord compression again, my friends. Um, and it's getting a little bit deeper. But as long as we have variability, we're not going to be too concerned. But I would definitely be calling the doctor. He needs to be in the room with this patient. So if he needs to intervene, he can. All right, so this baby's moving down. Is everyone doing OK? I feel like we've just been talking and talking. Oops. All right, again, we have to look at baseline. Always start with your baseline. We say baseline's about 140, 150. We look to see what the variability is. And we note that the variability is pretty well absent. There's not much going on in between those decelerations. So kind of scary. There, when we have absent variability, we know that the baby's environment is poor. Do we have accelerations? No, we do not. Do we have decelerations? Yes, we do. And it is dropping down into the 60s. What did we say normal fetal heart rate was? 110 to 160. So to drop down to 60, that's almost half of what the lowest parameter should be. This is very frightening. These decelerations are getting pretty long. They're going about a minute now. So that's a baby without oxygen for a full minute. And he's desperately fighting to get his heart rate back up. That is why there's so little in between of activity. So this baby's very, very sick, has a very frightening environment. So as you note down here with the nurse's um, discussions, they're shaving the abdomen here and they're taking her to surgery because they're going to get this baby out. This baby's in trouble and it's very scary. What do you see here? First of all, what's the baseline? Well, we only have a second here or so. We know that the baseline's about 130. We also know that the baby had some pretty good variability going on initially. Probably no accelerations, but we do note a prolonged deceleration. It dropped down into the 40s, got maybe back up to the 70s, 80s, but it is prolonged. We're going to, this is approximately 10 minute deceleration. And what I'm going to tell you is what has happened is we probably started an epidural here. One of the biggest risks to mother, may I repeat, biggest risk to mother during epidurals is maternal hypo hypotension. And if mother's hypotensive, baby's heart rate will drop. So this is maybe a response, I can't tell you for sure, but I'm assuming that this is a response to an epidural induction. Babe, mother became hypotensive, therefore baby had nothing, no perfusion, and so heart dropped his heart rate. And as you see, then the heart rate came back to the normal baseline up here because mom got her fluids. We turned her on her side. We got her heart or her blood pressure back up. And so now baby's perfusing normally. Same thing here. Again, fetal heart rate baseline is about 120, 130. And then it drops down into the 30s. We put in an internal monitor here. That's how I can tell is with this line right here. We have internal monitors on. And baby's trying to get back up and finally gets his baseline back up into the 110s. 
So very scary. What happened here? Couldn't tell you. But I presume again that it might be epidural. And mother became hypoxic or hypotensive. I'm sorry, mother became hypotensive, which led to some hypoxia for the baby. And once we got her blood pressure back up, then the baby's baseline came back up. All right. What is this? OK, we need to start with what is our baseline? What's our baseline here? And I know this one's a little more difficult to read. So we'll say it's about 120, 130. Baseline 120. What is the variability? I would say minimal. There's not much going on here in beat to beat, 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 beat to beat. There's not much. So I'm going to call this minimal variability. Does she have accelerations, which is our third piece of information? No. Does she have decelerations? Yes. Now we have to identify what kind. And to do that, we need to look at the contraction pattern. Here's a contraction. Here's a contraction. Here's a contraction. So what's the fetal heart rate doing with the contraction? Well, that doesn't look like much. Now I see a deceleration here. And a deceleration is falling after the contraction. What kind of deceleration was that? That was late deceleration. That represents placental insufficiency. Because when the placenta, when that perfusion is back, when the contraction is over, all the blood is back in the placenta, we should see the fetal heart rate go back to baseline or be accelerating. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing decelerations. So that's placental insufficiency. Okay, So placental insufficiency, which are very scary, late decelerations, means the placenta is sick, which means this baby's not going to cope with labor over any long period of time. So I'm going to have to watch this pretty closely and let my physician know that this baby's having some late decelerations. And what would he like to do about that? And then he has to make the decision. Again, what is your baseline? Boy, it's hard to tell. Is the baseline 180 or is the baseline 130s? It's very hard to tell. So if we go with the baseline of 180, we already know that that's a problem, right? That's called fetal tachycardia. But I think what's really happening here is we have a baseline of about 130. And this baby is desperately trying to overshoot. This is hard to tell, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really sorry. We can't really tell. Unless I have historical information which takes me back here, I would have a better picture of what's going on. Because I find it very difficult to believe that a baby would accelerate for three minutes. But then I have difficulty believing. No, it's probably those are probably late decelerations. And why is he having late decelerations? And he's already, well, two things. Tachycardia, we know baby's already in trouble. If he's having late decelerations, we know that the placenta is not doing well. So this bears significant watching. But again, unless I go back here and note what's been happening prior to these types of uh, visuals, I'm really not going to have a clear picture. So that is just giving us an example of do not make a decision on fetal monitoring or do not make a decision on medical management unless you have a very clear picture of what's going on. We need to know more information to make a decision on this strip. So what do we do when we have fetal distress? We'll just give me a few more minutes, ladies and gentlemen. We'll have concluded. So with fetal distress, which you saw some late decelerations or decrease in baseline or decrease variability, we're going to be concerned about that because that means baby's not coping with the labor process, which is a traumatic event for a baby. It can be stressful for a baby. And if he's not been healthy, if his environment's not been healthy, he's not going to cope very well with this constant pressure with these hypoxic events, as I call them. So what I'm going to do, if I know that the baby's having some distress, or what we're calling it now is intolerance of labor, is first and foremost, always, first and foremost, may I repeat, first and foremost, your initial response is to change her position. Sometimes just changing her position will give the baby a little better perfusion. Because if mom's laying a little too flat, or if she's really tensed up, She's not in a good position for perfusion of her placenta. That's going to cause the baby to have some problems. So we want to do that first. 
Next, we're going to give her some fluids. Make sure we increase the regular fluids. We never hang an IV in labor and delivery without it being a main line or primary fluid bolus, or I'm sorry, fluid line. In labor and delivery, we use lactated ringers most of the time. Because these women are young and healthy, they can tolerate large boluses of fluid, so you don't have to worry that this is going to cause any congestive heart failure or pulmonary congestion. So we can give her 500 to 800, maybe even a full liter of fluid in very short periods of time, and she will tolerate that. And it provides perfusion for the placenta. It allows the placenta to fill up again and to perfuse that good oxygenated blood back to the baby. So change your position, give her fluids, then give mom oxygen. And we're not giving little amounts of oxygen. We're giving oxygen by mask, so it's a higher concentration. And we're giving her 8 to 10 liters, because we need to get that oxygen all the way down to that placental bed. So she's got to breathe deep, large volumes of oxygen to try and give that baby some extra perfusion. So we're, we're changing mom's position, we're giving fluids, we're giving large volumes of oxygen. That's going to increase the fetal heart rate. We will stop Pitocin if it is running, because Pitocin only makes the contraction stronger. We need to notify our provider immediately that this has happened, and we need to date and time stamp everything we have done which sometimes gets in the way because if we're busy doing these things, we don't have time to document. Well, there's a nice little tool on the fetal monitor called the mark. And when you push that button, it'll place a little mark or a little arrow on the fetal monitor strip. And then when you see your arrows, you will know that you did something at each of those arrows. And when you go back to do your documentation, you will see that at 1301, I changed your position. At 1302, I started the IV, I opened up the IV fluids. At at 1304, she got oxygen. So you will have a timestamp of everything you've done. Please remember, the fetal monitoring, working in a labor and delivery suite, is very litigious. This is a great place for things to go badly. And when things are going badly, you need to have your documentation very clear. It doesn't help 30 minutes later, an hour later, the next day. You will not remember the steps you took. So please use your mark button on your fetal monitor to ensure that you know exactly what is happening at what time so you can go back and document everything very clearly so you have a time uh, date stamp on all your paperwork. All right, so those are the steps for fetal intolerance of labor. Change your position and increasing fluids, stopping Pitocin and giving oxygen are all happening at the same time because remember you're not going to be in the room alone. When we see changes in fetal heart monitoring that we're concerned about, multiple nurses come to the rescue, so you're not alone. So those things are all happening pretty much at the same time. But changing your position is the initial step. But remember, when all is said and done, if you want to work in labor and delivery, you must not only have the knowledge to read the fetal heart rate tracings, but know how to accurately interpret it, and you will be legally held to the standard of care. So think about that very closely. This is a legal obligation to the patient and the physician caring for this patient because he's not in the room with you. Lawsuits happen for lack of observation or lack of response to fetal heart rate changes. You must be vigilant. And that concludes this presentation on fetal heart tracing. If you have any questions, please go ahead and email me, and I will try to answer them or set up an appointment to review things with you. I'm happy to do that as well. Otherwise, in our first um, clinical rotation in week uh, two or three, we will, be, we will be looking over some fetal monitor strips. Remember, these are legal documents, and we cannot give pieces of it away. All right, you all have a wonderful day, and thank you for participating today.